approach me from my dad. My lips tremble, my eyes close, and I shatter like a plate into a million tiny pieces. I start grief crying, which uh, feels a lot more like dry heaving than any kind of crying that I used to do. When this happens, usually in the middle of the night, I frantically search for something to anchor me to his memory. Most of the time, I Google his name. I see the day that he died appear on the screen before me, and I say it to myself. March 11th, 2018. I feel even emptier when I see the blank space on the webpage where his obituary might have been. Sometimes I try to start writing one for him, even though it's months too late. A couple sentences in, I always start feeling nauseous. I realize that I need to read his words, not mine, so I search for pieces of his writing that I never found before his death. Transfigured, he is no longer held by great wars or lovers. No one's mercenary, he leaves the page forever. In my most desperate moments, I message my mom, his old classmates, the drummer from his college band, searching for new stories about him to replace my own. I feel like I'm breathing through a straw at this point, and I know I should go back to sleep. I have class tomorrow, but I turn to my own emails, to Facebook messages and texts with him. I desperately wish for more of these, even though I have to sit through all the shitty messages from his bad weeks before I finally find something that makes me calm enough to go back to sleep. For as long as I can remember, my dad's personality and his parenting waxed and waned with his illness. In my very first memory of him, he drove a stolen police car to my house and snatched me out of bed, hallucinating that I was trapped inside of a fire. He was tortured by nightmares, asleep or awake. In my second memory of him, he took me to visit his writing 101 class at Duke. He gave me a mini notebook and let me sit with the first tears during lecture. It was around that time that my dad chose to leave my mom, my sister, and me. The rest of my memories of him are contained in choppy, Custody visits that very significantly with his health. But during the good weeks, there were Shrek impressions, coach up runs, and radio head albums. But the bad weeks were really, really bad. As his illness worsened, he stopped teaching. Furious with his own mind and the world inside of it, he lashed out, often and with a vengeance. The good days were few and far between by the time that I started middle school. He began sending me disturbing messages in bursts, sometimes close to 100 in a single day, criticizing my decisions, my intelligence, and my being. I don't think of you as a son anymore, he wrote. I'm sorry that you're such an idiot that you don't know what I need. You won't be hearing from me again. Sometimes I might be better that way, but there were always new messages. I have blackouts, dementia, and do things with no memory. I got into a fight with my neighbor and I almost killed him. I don't want to get to that point again. I cannot get in a downward spiral or I might do something that's out of my control. I do not fear death. Let's end it here. No drama. Let's just good luck on your friends. My psychiatrist at Duke told me to tell you that people like me don't live very long and that it's damaging to the psyche of the survivor once the parent is dead. I'm not going to let you drive me to kill myself. He spent sporadic weeks and voluntarily committed to a number of psychiatric facilities including Duke's own for part of my sophomore year. The risk that he posed to himself is what frightened me more than anything. He reminded me often that he could die any day and told me that I would regret taking space from him and letting it into him. It took me so long to realize that his mind and his body were raging against the fading of his light. Not against me or the small circle of people that stuck around to see the journey through. It was during spring break last year that I got the dreaded call from the only thing set out first. My dad had died the night before, and I felt just as shocked and guilty as he said I was. I went to his house to say a final goodbye. When I used to visit him, he would stay in bed for days on end, surrounded by pill bottles. I would regularly take breaks from playing with my sister to rest her hand on his chest, confirming with the rise and the fall that he was still in there somewhere. 
I didn't know what to expect seeing him lifeless. I had never really seen him full of life. The sight of a completely motionless body was so unfamiliar that I had to stare for several minutes, convincing myself that I thought I saw his fingers twitch or his chest fall, that it was just an illusion. My mom stood nervously behind me. I couldn't stop thinking that this is the last time that I'm ever going to be in a room with both of my parents again. It felt like a momentous accomplishment that the three of us had walked the path shaped by trauma and mercy and still found ourselves together in <coughs> some peace. For me, growing up with a parent who suffered so much with his mental health was marked by uncertainty and self-blame. I mourned the things that he carried and that he sometimes had to carry them alone. But they were so fucking heavy, and I felt weak. You know, experts say that when you're grieving a loss, it's best not to make any major decisions for at least a year. It's not exactly practical advice when you're graduating from college. But I am paralyzed by fear, and I agonize over the smallest decision. I can somehow tie every single choice back to his life and his death. I mean, if I were to die at 49, would I be happy with who I was and how I lived? In that way, Losing a parent in college feels a lot like an early onset midlife crisis. It forces you to confront your own mortality and grand insignificance. The flesh that made your flesh was just flesh after all. It turns out the only thing harder than having a complicated relationship with my dad is grieving a complicated relationship with my dad. And grieving at Duke is a nightmare. I think it might even be a silent epidemic. Nobody knows what to say. This is called me. For those who have said something, almost anything, they have carried me this year. When I first got back to school, I fought every instinct in my body, screaming, go home, get out. This place is not gentle, and it's not real deal. And for the most part, I haven't. I deny myself opportunities to think and talk about loss because mourning feels like a distraction. I learned how to schedule a meltdown. Without bothering anybody or disturbing the beach. I goof up my dad's name when I need a good cry, but most days I ignore the central slice of my life. Because what defines Duke students more than our ability to compartmentalize and trivialize? To reduce even the richest and the most fundamental human experiences like grieving into inconveniences. I'm thankful for what my dad taught me about the strength of the human spirit. Ripped through my life like a meteor in motion with mystery, lighting the night for a moment and making me look up and wonder. His love felt like hate. His hate felt like love. And all at once, he made up half of me and took three fourths of me. I miss thinking that things may be different when I grow up. I even miss being mangled by her. <laughs> and that's still where I'm at. Wrestling with what he gave, took, and left behind. But above all, missing our shared reality. A reality in which we weren't separated by a cosmic void. Back when I could still sing him a song, it would make me think of him. Packaging our relationship as something that has taught me empathy or resilience would feel fake. Because more than anything, 